Good morning. Yay, somebody's awake. <laughs> I have my coffee. Does everybody else have their coffee? <laughs> this is a session alert statement. We are expecting you to participate. So if you don't have coffee, you better get some because you're going to be participating. Uh, you're going to have the opportunity to actually talk in this session. In fact, it's all about you. We're going to ask you to speak to issues of concern or things that excite you about nursing education. And we're going to be asking you to participate at the microphones that you see there in the audience. I hope you can see them because the lights are so bright we can't see them. Um, and we will invite you to participate in a minute after we set the session up. We welcome you to the National Faculty Meeting on behalf of the Board of Governors and the NLN staff. I am Pat Yoderweiss, the NLN Chair, and I am honored to chair this meeting today. I'm joined by Dr. Kathleen Poindexter, NLN Chair-Elect. Thank you, Pat. Um, welcome to everyone again, and I hope that you all had a good evening last night and, and had some time to enjoy, and that you're ready to begin um, to learn about more about nursing education and collaborate with each other, and we're looking forward to hearing from you about issues and concerns that you have about nursing education today. So this is going to sort of be a casual conversation between the two of us and all of you. Um, so far, I think this has been an exciting summit. We started off with Tim talking about innovation and how important it is. It has. Um, next, I think what was really important and really exciting was the announcement regarding the unique relationship with the RQI partners. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. And it, for those that didn't hear, it's not, yes. that is the future of nursing period. I think that is so tremendous. And as you know, for those that didn't know, that was our unique relationship as well with our partners from American Heart Association and Lairdall Medical. This partnership is all about saving lives. And for us in nursing education, it's to help our students learn to be prepared and proficient as they enter into practice. Uh, and for me, the, the big thing is, it's about demonstrating competencies that are based on research. And the best part of it, of course, is that it's research from two, two well, not a, two, a group of nurses, but represented by two of our consistent members who have participated here at NLN. Uh, Marilyn and Susie were with us yesterday, received an award, and then talked with deans and directors and how they could engage with this activity. And it struck me yesterday when a CEO of the American Heart Association attends a meeting, it's an important meeting, and the CEO of the American Heart Association was at this meeting to because it was an important meeting to the American Heart Association to be sure that nursing students got engaged with this project. I was pretty excited that he was here. That was very exciting. Most of all, what about Bev's exhilarating speech yesterday? Yeah. How many of you heard that? Was that amazing, exciting? Did it just build the enthusiasm? I can say is I was really glad she followed her and not me. <laughs> That brings us to this special meeting this morning because it really is all about you. Um, Pat and I talked about this and what we really want is to hear from you as we said earlier and to learn what are some opportunities, what are some things that are concerning you and, and we really designated this session as a listening opportunity. Um, I, you, you get to listen to everybody throughout the entire summit. Right now this is your time to speak with us so we can listen. You know, we all know this has really been uh, a devastating year, year and a half, 24 months, however long you've been engaged with us. And um, 
as we've said before, almost all of the public press has really focused, rightfully so, uh, on nurses at the bedside. And we want to really capitalize now on nurses at the classroom, computer, simulation side, clinical side with students. And so uh, we know that during uh, COVID, we made some adaptations and our classroom occurred in our bedrooms or our kitchens or our patios or wherever it was we could get a strong enough Wi-Fi signal that we could connect with our students. And that sometimes the classroom occurred at midnight and sometimes it occurred during what we might think of as regular hours, but the key was we made great ad adaptations to be there for students. And we'd like to hear some of your stories uh, about how you made those adaptations, about how you adapted your simulation activities, and about how you transformed your activities related to clinical and maybe about some of the challenges that remain and how you're transitioning back to clinical and back to the classroom. We know that this has not been a smooth transition. We know that there are great variations among states, among cities, um, probably across streets, <laughs> depending on uh, what facility you are in. Uh, and so this is your opportunity uh, to express concerns, to express joy, and we invite you to the microphone. Okay. So let's have a courageous conversation. Tell us what's on your mind. Tell us what worked, what didn't work, and we've got pens and we're ready to take notes. And so there are some microphones. Um, I see one here and I think there are more. Uh, we have uh, some staff who are, are helping us with the microphone. I'm hoping, I, again, we can't see too well here to know. Uh, what, are there staff out there? Helping? I do see. Oh, there's yes. a hand. And I there's a them. hand. Yes, yep. okay. See them. We have staff at each microphone who will help monitor the mobs of people lining up <laughs> at the microphone. Please do maintain your social distance. Do not uh, mob each other. Oh, and we do have someone over here. Here we yep. go. Yay. Here we go. Good for I'd you. open this up. Good morning, folks. <clears throat> Cheryl Williams from Salem State University. I just thought I'd open this up with a comment. I don't know if anyone has ever thought this before, but teaching through Zoom was painful. It was <clears throat> kind of like when you put a video um, screen on uh, the, the campfire, you know? You can, you, can, you can see the flickering. You can hear the wood you know, crackling, you, but you can't see the warmth and you can't be there. So um, I told my students that and together we all just envisioned a fireplace where we can all be together. So thank you. Now please share your stories. Great, great. What a great analogy though. It's in your mind. Create the picture in your mind. Sue. Hi, Nancy Perry. I'm from Carroll Community College in Westminster, Maryland. So my question is, about caring for COVID positive and PUI patients in the hospital. Um, our practice partners are telling us our graduates are not prepared to care for these patients. However, our mm. practice partners are also prohibiting us from caring those patients while they're students. So I'm looking for any strategies or anything that I can help move that conversation along with my partners. Um, I think they may be willing to hear. And if it's about supplies, we were fortunate, at least where I am, that the state of Maryland provided us with KN95s for all of our students to be fit tested. So it's not a supply issue with that piece. So I'm looking for strategies. That's a great question. If anybody has some other strategies, I can, I can share. I think the biggest challenge that we've seen is that it, there's been a lot of inconsistencies with what our healthcare partners expect from our, from our students and what they're willing to allow them to participate in what kind of supplies, um, it, it, that's been part of the challenge is, as everyone does have different expectations and it's really been working with them and partnering with them. Um, um, AONL had a uh, recent uh, podcast 
not podcast, I'm so sorry, uh, webinar. And um, I believe it was the person from Yale New Haven who talked about the fact that um, she perceived she made a mistake in not allowing students in initially, but realized immediately that that was not a good strategy and has corrected that. I think as more CNOs say, well, wait a minute, this is not good for the profession, especially from leading institutions, the better we will be able to make the argument to all organizations that this is not a good idea to close out students because it affects the whole production stream in terms of experiences. And so um, if you can find that video, uh, I'm sure it, it was recorded, where people are saying that's not a good strategy and we really need to correct that, I think that would be very useful. I agree, COVID's here to stay. It's not going away for a while. Who's next? Hi, Cheryl Schmidt, Arizona State University in Phoenix. And I've been heavily involved in the whole COVID response because our, our university created a saliva test to do and I've been supervising students out in the community. They've helped give uh, 7.1 million immunizations in the community. Wow. And uh, I'm also the one that does sick testing for all of our students and faculty. And we have to keep struggling to get the right kinds of PPE and the ho one hospital mm. wants the students to change their N95 after every patient. And that's not, that's not feasible. So those are two or three dollars a piece. So I think we need to get some uh, collaboration between part uh, clinical partners in education. Who's going to provide the PPE? Once we sit test them, can the hospital provide it if they contaminate a mask in a COVID room? So I think we need a lot more conversation on that. Great, thank you. Rose Santi, Trinita School of Nursing in Elizabeth, New Jersey. During COVID, I furloughed one of my full-time faculty to be a staff at the hospital. I have three CCRNs on my faculty, and they worked after their usual faculty work, mm. and, that br and they brought students with them, and it was a really good work between the hospital and the School of Nursing. Oh. Additionally, the uh, Board of Nursing wanted us to graduate students in order to get, give them temporary permits as they are during the height of the COVID vaccine, so, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So it, it has to be a, a relationship with the hospital. So they continued to have our students and we provided them with really very experienced, certified educators with CCRN. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you to Arizona for all the immunizations that they were able to share. Thank you for sharing our resources. And I think those are great examples of, of academic um, healthcare partnerships that work. Thank you. Over here. Hi, good morning. Jackie Michael from the University of Texas Arlington, College of Nursing Health Innovation. Um, in all this gloom and doom, really appreciate having NLN in person. I really am enjoying seeing people, hugging those that I can, miss <laughs> the human touch. Um, do want to encourage everybody. My experience in COVID was a little bit different. Technology was fortified. The university units understood what the needs were to support. So the infrastructure is improving. I'm excited about that. I hope that continues as a result of teaching from home and teaching distance classes or via Zoom and Teams. Our challenge was clinical placement. I worked with the graduate office, mm -hmm. graduate program, and as a clinical placement faculty, we have dedicated five faculty who do nothing but find placements that are challenging so students can maintain their degree plan and progression. And um, happy to report, we've had a extremely, extremely successful placement rate for our students. People have continued. Outliers may be less than one to two percent that we weren't able to place. I'm just surprised at people and their professionalism 
to just rise up and help the nursing students. So many negative things have happened. My experience has been positive. Not to say there are no challenges, but I'm just loving the relational piece as we come out of COVID. Thank you. All right, right. that. Great, yes. So, um, uh, Carolyn Montoya from University of New Mexico. Um, first of all, I just want to recognize uh, that this is a National Hispanic uh, Month, so we are very mm. proud that we have 40%. 40% Hispanic students at our uh, institution, wow. at our College of Nursing. Say so, that again, please. Pardon me? Say How that you? again, please. 40% of our... Got that? 40%. 40% of our College of Nursing students are Hispanic for you. Um, so this is the challenge. I would like to know how other universities are dealing with this. When I get back next week, I am meeting with the students that have exemptions to um, the vaccine. I was very surprised at the number of nursing students who did not want to get the vaccine. So at this point, the College of Nursing has taken a stance that we will not allow students who are not vaccinated into clinical uh, rotations. Some of our clinical partners are allowed, some very, very, very few, allowing that they could do a rotation there as long as they have the university exemption and they also fill out that exemption. We are holding firm not to allow anyone for the following reasons. One, first, do no harm to the patient. Second, the majority of my faculty, at least half of my faculty, are in a certain age group, <laughs> including myself. Uh, and third, we have some faculty who are immunocompromised. But what do I do with what I, right now my plan is to tell the students, um, at this point, I cannot guarantee your clinical rotation. I cannot guarantee that you can complete our program. So what do I do? Give them an incomplete, give them a withdrawal, give them a leave of absence. So I would like to know what other schools are doing with students who have exemptions. So could we ask those of you who are at the microphone, please to stay in place, but let's have some responses to this question here. We have a hand up over here and here. Would you two please go to this microphone? And if anyone is there in place, keep your place, but let these two people precede you. Thanks so much, um, Diane Mancino, National Student Nurses Association Executive Director. Uh, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing will be releasing guidance on this specific issue on Monday. And, and basically the guidance is going to say, now I know there are exemptions, but you know, it, that you really should probably go through your legal department to ensure that those exemptions are, are accurate and legal and not forgeries and not, you know, things that are made up. Um, but the good news is that they're saying that people who want alternative clinical sites and clinical experiences will not be, should not be granted. Because the, um, the whole goal here is to have students exposed to real patients in real time and that is going to benefit their nursing education, obviously. So watch for the NCSBN um, guidance because I think that uh, it, it's going to really help to inform your decisions around this. Thank, Thank you, you very Diana. much, Diana. Hi, hi, yes, my name is Dr. Rhonda Rogers from the University of District of Columbia. Uh, we have had few students that put in exemption well, because of religion, regions, or whatever. So what my email stated, I understand your exemption, but just to note that if a facility makes a decision that you have to get vaccinated and you refuse, you have not met the course objective. And because if you do not meet the course objective, you will not be successful in this course. And you either have to repeat or find another profession. Straight point, that's it. That's all we can say. We go by what our handbook says, 
We try to keep it legal, make sure we document, you send an email, anything that shows a paper trail, documentation that you inform the student, and just leave it of, of that nature because students love to go to court. So as long as you keep your, as we know, if it's not documented, it doesn't happen. So as long as we have that documentation shown, we inform them, and this is what happened because we had to do it with another student. They tried to sue, we showed documentation, and we were done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did anyone else have a response to that? Yes, here at, at this microphone. Teresa Delahoyd, I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Nursing at Bryan College of Health Sciences in Lincoln, Nebraska. And unfortunately, our state doesn't have a high, high vaccination rate. In fact, we have facilities across the state that aren't even requiring the vaccine. And so we as a college are requiring it, but we are allowing for exemptions. And with those exemptions, then they have to get weekly testing. If they do not get weekly testing, they cannot go into clinical sites. Now, I'm also the chair of the Nebraska Assembly of Nursing Deans and Directors, and that is 17 schools of nursing that get together quarterly. We actually came up with a position statement for our clinical facilities, and we asked them to please be very clear with us on their guidelines for COVID. And if they do allow exemptions, what are those exemptions and what are the, qual the requirements that we have to follow? Because we are getting all kinds of answers and schools of nursing are just scrambling trying to figure out what each clinical facility is requiring. So I wish we could go to a point where we would say, we absolutely want everybody to have it and you, there are no exemptions whatsoever. Our faculty all believe that at my college, we're all 100% vaccinated. Unfortunately, we're not there as a state. So I just wanted to provide that information. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. And w excuse me, would you come back to the mic one minute, please? Tell us the name of the group again. The Nebraska Assembly of Nursing Deans and Directors. Thank you. So we put out a position statement this past week. We were actually waiting for something from the National Council, so I'm excited that they're going to be coming out with something. And would you mind sending a copy of that to NLN? Sure. Absolutely. Um, Ariel, would you mind fo following up with her? You're the first person I see there whom I can identify because you have on a bright yellow shirt. <laughs> Okay. Was there anyone else who was waiting to talk with this? Okay. So now we're back in the sequence of. Uh, was there what? No. One, she was, no. Yeah. Now we're back in the sequence, and this is the microphone here. Yes. Okay. You're next. My name is Mitzi Averett, and I am from Methodist University in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I am also a faculty member in long-term recovery from substance misuse. Last year, the overdose rate was up 33%. Mm -hmm. Over 95,000 people died, and some of them were college students. I have a great awareness of some resources through, I'm, I'm, I have a question. Does, does any faculty in this room know that your college has a collegiate recovery program besides me. Yes, I see one, two. So I travel the country doing professional development through the SIM Leader Program. And when I first learned about collegiate recovery, I would go to a location and I would say, I'm so excited. You have such a great resource to support students who may be struggling. And the group of nursing faculty would say, what? I don't know what you're talking about. So I would really, be, it is also National Recovery Month. SAMHSA has been celebrating this for over 30 years. And it's not well known if it's not your particular area, but I believe that all nursing faculty should know about recovery high schools. There are three in Boston. And collegiate recovery programs that are really thriving. Last, in fall semester, I had one nursing student whose brother overdosed and she dropped out. And I had the president of our Student Nurse Association whose best friend, that they were roommates, to her, to her best friend's brother overdosed. It is, if you don't know someone, it's probably because you don't talk about this very much or make it a safe thing to talk about. So I would just greatly appreciate more knowledge and awareness and, and faculty looking into 
more dynamic, appropriate peer support recovery options for our nursing students and all students at our university. Thank you. And would you be willing to get that information I would. to us? Yes. Again, if you would get that to Ariel, I'm, I'm sorry we're going to flood you, Ariel. <laughs> I know you will wear it brown from now on. <laughs> thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. For Thanks. Listening. Thank you for sharing as well and, and your willingness to share, talk about yeah. such a critical topic yes. that is in the Yes, and, and while we like to think it, it affects other students, it affects our students too. So thank you. And our peers. Yes, and our peers. Good morning. I am Leslie Gatterson. I am from Arizona College of Nursing, Dallas. Um, teaching during COVID uh, via Zoom was definitely a challenge. But what it did for me is it allowed me to meet my students where they are. I created a study session called NCLEX and Chill, which occurred after hours. And so we know that students not, don't just study eight to five, Monday through Friday. So what I did was I'm an old night shift nurse. And so <laughs> many of you guys know that we're up at four in the morning. And so I had the opportunity to meet with the students across the entire curriculum. And we had fundamental students to our senior students and they were there to encourage each other. And oh, so I just, I nice. wanted everybody to remember if we do have to go back to, I pray not, um, teaching via Zoom, that think outside the box to make those connections with your students because it really helped our students stay engaged even though they were outside of the classroom. Um, at that particular university, we had our skills on campus, and they were so engaged in skills, not just because um, they had to come, they wanted to come because they still felt like they had that faculty connection. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Great idea. I would be nothing at 4 a.m., but boy, would I be fabulous <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> We'll test that one, Pat. Good morning. I'm Valeria Ramden from Northeastern University in Boston. And the two points that I want to address, when COVID hit all of us, um, as part of a larger university, the School of Nursing was looked to to be the microcosm for healthcare delivery. And I'm, I'm telling you, I don't think that we were prepared. I was part of the task force as a nurse practitioner as well. And we were looked to from anything from, you know, testing and surveillance thing and contact tracing all the way up to, you know, what we do now. And I don't know in terms of lessons learned across the nation if we are prepared within our universities and colleges to be that microcosm of a healthcare system. But I think going forward that we probably ought to prepare ourselves such. The second point is as families were shut out from healthcare institutions, we realized and saw and mm -hmm. testified that many of our nurses were suffering a lot of moral distress as they held hands of dying patients, et cetera, and families you know, stayed at home. And I was part of a national task force that also looked at this piece. And through Plane Tree International, we came up with a policy toolkit to help guide our nurse leaders into how best to navigate those waters to make it a little less cumbersome and challenging. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. I'm Lisa Rabeshi, Associate Dean at the School of Nursing, Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. And I wanted to speak to the preparation of students to care for patients with COVID, um, that question before. And Patricia, your comment about the webinar. So um, we had the pleasure, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Beth Beckman from Yale New Haven Hospital um, in the late fall semester to develop a program called the Bridge for Professional Practice. We developed and implemented the program in a record time, three weeks, and had hundreds of nursing students practicing over the five week winter session caring for patients with COVID. Our work um, has been submitted for a publication and I would encourage folks to look at that work about transitioning to practice so our students are prepared for the reality of COVID. 
Thank you. So don't look for the video. Just find her. <laughs> that, that and she talked about the the idea of the bridge program and how effective it was. Thank you so yes. much for coming and sharing that. Uh, it sounded like really fabulous work of how to quickly correct something that once she realized that, well, this isn't going to work, made a difference in terms of helping students and getting them back in to the stream because if we cut off the stream, we have affected what happens for our whole profession. Uh, I think this is next. Yes. yes. Morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Luce. I am a third year at Penn State University College of Nursing. I also serve as the president of the National Student Nurses Association. Woo -hoo! Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to talk to you guys today about our upcoming and new Leadership U Honor Society. It is an honor society specifically focused to kind of capitalize on leadership within your local, state, and national level students. It's different from Sigma. You don't need a GPA requirement. You don't have to be the top 30 some percent of your class. It's solely based on being a leadership in your community. And that's what we're needing in our nursing field. We need future leaders. We don't need that GPA because once you walk across the graduation uh, stage, that GPA falls right off. It means nothing. So we're helping nursing students build their professional identity in nursing and really kind of captivating on their accomplishments that they're making in their college career. And it gets you a cord at graduation. And who doesn't love cords? <laughs> so if you guys have any questions about the Leadership View Honor Society, please feel free to stop by the NSMA booth. It's 206 in the exhibit hall. I would love to talk to any and all of you about it. And I really hope you get your students involved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for being here. I, I just want to give them a pitch too. Your website is absolutely amazing, and the resources that NSNA has for nurse educators is yes. tremendous right now. So kudos yeah. to the whole organization. And is our advisor for NSNA with us today? Is Cheryl here? I, she was here earlier, but I didn't see her today. I don't see her here. Thank you for all your work. Oh, right there. Yeah. She's right there behind. <laughs> I'm, I'm Dr. Cheryl Taylor. I'm a <laughs> National League for Nursing consultant to the National Student Nurses Association. And I have an appeal to all of us as faculty uh, because one of the unintended consequences of the pandemic is a, um, a, a, a large cohorts of students who have replaced hand washing with using sanitizer. Oh. So I, I work in a lab, I, I see a lot of coming and goings, and I have witnessed students uh, coming and going in and out of these places, and I will say, did you wash your hands? And they say, well, I'm, you will use sanitizer. And so there are large, I mean, there, there's almost like a, a, a year, a generation of people who, that primary hand washing, what we learned as hand washing, is simply just pulling out and using the sanitizer. And to use that from your initial days all the way through, to not see faculty washing their hands, and to think that that is the norm is not acceptable and it's not meeting the standard that we teach as far as the basic fundamental role of hand washing. So I know with the pandemic there are a lot of adjustments that had to be made, but there are a lot of reasons why we in nursing can't afford to throw the baby out with the bath water. And hand washing is our baby. So I'm just asking all of us to let students see us washing our hands and encourage them to wash their hands 
and try to help them to understand that that is not an automatic. The world hasn't changed so much that, oh, <laughs> forget about washing hands. That's the public. That's what the public people do. We in healthcare, we use hand sanitizers as our hand washing technique. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Cheryl. <laughs> Important reminder. Sue. Good morning. My name is Beth Gaza, and I am the Associate Director for Faculty and Staff Development and a professor in the School of Nursing at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And I want to speak on behalf of the academic nurse educators in the room and beyond. I believe that the pandemic has highlighted the special role of the academic nurse educator. The use of technology in teaching and the vast number of innovations that were based on sound educational theory and principles that they put in place are just, it just blows my mind when I think about the work that has been done to keep the, the pipeline going, to continue to prepare nurses um, for practice. This has been challenging for uh, seasoned academic nurse educators, but even more so for new academic nurse educators. Um, and those with limited educational preparation. Recent changes in the nurse preparation competencies seem to overlook the specialty role of nurse educators and academic nurse educators and the development of competencies specific to teaching and learning. And so I speak in, uh, to encourage this group to advocate for recognition of the academic nurse educator role as an advance specialty role because it indeed is. It was before the pandemic and it has been highlighted because of the pandemic. So thank you. Beth. I think this is now, yep, Beth. Dr. Malone. <laughs> uh, this is Beverly Malone and I am the president and CEO for the National League for Nursing. And I just rise to the floor to want to support our Student Nurses Association, our National Student Nurses Association. I know that budgets are tight and that I hope that's not the first thing that you eliminate because this is so much in terms of where your students get their support and where they can go. And so it is with heartfelt determination that I am standing and rising and asking that you give some strong consideration that if you're not supporting your student nurses association, please begin to. This is their journey to leadership and to working in a collaborative way called team nursing. Thank you. Hello, this is Dr. Rogers again. I just want to mention what our university did to, for the faculty and for our students. They recognized how COVID hit us mentally. It was a mental impact on students and faculty. We had sessions where everyone was just to say, to speak on how COVID affected you personally and professionally. What can the university do to help you? We had, when we had our, a few meetings, it wasn't straight to the book. How are you doing? What are you doing? Do, how can we help you? We had sessions with students where we did the same thing. We're not gonna teach. Let's speak on how, what's going on. How can we help you? How can we assist you? We didn't want the students and the faculty to know all it is about is business that we care about you professionally and mentally. And that open that avenue for us made us feel special and part of the University of District of Columbia family. I just wanted to share that because I wanted to share the mental aspect of how COVID affected the faculty mm -hmm. and the students. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning all. Good I'm Brother Ignatius Perkins. I won't uh, share my history. You already got that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I bet we didn't get it all. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Um, 
What I wanted to share with you is an experience that I, I've had for many years in nursing is that, in, as we now all know, I, I also responding to my colleague who talked about how can we help one another, I think that's a very critical uh, uh, part of this, how to respond to the current culture where uh, disease is, is uh, defining who we are. And we, 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 who we need to be as, as nurses are human persons caring for another person. I say that because I think the, uh, I told students when they get into situations with themselves, with their family, with their faculty, as well as faculty and patients, the critical question is, a simple question, five words, how can I help you? And it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's amazing what patients will tell you. Patients come to the hospital because they're sick. They know they're sick. But taking the opportunity to talk to them about how can I help you is very revealing. For example, I was working with one of our nursing students some, some years ago, and the charge nurse came in with a chart and talked to the patient about all the clinical conditions that he were, for why he was admitted. And he was very uh, aggressive and inappropriate with her. The nursing student witnessed this, and she said, how am I going to engage this patient? I said, what I want you to do is you go in, introduce yourself, sit down in a chair so the, 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 the level is, is equal, and ask the patient, how can I help you? And she did that. She said, you can't believe what he told me. I said, what did he tell you? He said, he told me that uh, two days before he was admitted to the hospital with congestive heart failure, he buried his wife after 50 years of marriage. That was never part of the history that he brought to the hospital, but he needed an opportunity to, to share that with, with uh, with someone, so I think that that's an example uh, that I think that we, we can use as educators, even talking and sharing with our colleagues who are in practice, who are, who are uh, our colleagues in nursing education. I believe uh, and, uh, uh, that we as, edu we as nurse educators, our primary responsibility is not to provide education, but to be formators of the human person. And the whole question of how we take these four values in our lab make them live in patients' lives as well as ourselves. It's particularly, I think, I think, important today with so many losses that we experience in our hospitals. How do our colleagues deal when they have to stand before the patient with hands empty, knowing that they cannot cure, but they continue to care? So I, I think that as asking the patients and our colleagues, how can I help you, is very, very revealing, very opening, and uh, it, it sets the, the, the Confirms the dynamic about who we are as, as formators and how these four values of NLM are really given life into all, all that we're doing. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Five, you. Beautiful. Five very powerful words. <clears throat> right. Hi, good morning. Desiree Diaz from University of Central Florida. First of all, I would like to thank the NLM for making a position statement um, to not really against the 1,000 extra or 500 additional hours for um, nurse practitioners, because really that's gonna have a trickle down effect and really bog down how we can't get those hours right now um, without a battle and a fight for our advanced or graduate students, but also really looking at the nurse educator on, on behalf of all of the nurse educators here, not having that national backing and the person who spoke before me, really we need the deans and the directors to be fighting that nurse educators are an advanced practice. We are valuable in the realm of academia and education. And I don't know about my fellow colleagues here in this room, but you feel um, helpless. So I'm happy to know that the NLN is fighting on the behalf of educators and um, that graduate level education as advanced practice. So thank you. And we will continue. You are, you are welcome. And uh, let me just give you a little alert. And that is that we have been working diligently over the last 45 years. No, I, I think it's, it feels like that, but it's probably been about a month. Quite a while. A, about there. a month. Um, uh, Wait till she on, finishes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, on a, a statement on workforce, uh, to be more specific about the fact that how you create workforce depends on what you have as nurse educators. 
And you can't create a workforce unless you have nurse educators. And the, the key is that that has not yet been addressed. And so you will be seeing sometime soon, one hopes, uh, a statement that supports all, all that's been said so far about uh, the, the need for nurses and what the p pandemic has done, uh, but then directs it toward the need in the profession for nurse educators, well-qualified nurse educators, to produce the people who will complete the, the um, profession in terms of the numbers and the mix and the diversity and all of that that is needed for the future. So keep your eyes open for something. But don't keep them wide open because it may take a while and we don't want you to get, you know, corneal abrasions or something. Okay. Good morning. I'm Beth Phillips, a faculty emeritus from Duke University. I am the strategic nursing advisor for ATI. And I'm also the chair elect for the International Society for Professional Identity in Nursing. I love so much of what was said, and I was trying to remember people's names to link what I'm saying, but I've now forgotten them. So um, my concern is about our recent graduates. I think being here this week shows me the tenacity and resilience of us as educators. And our students are being put into the workplace, some early, as we've said, you know, they get their license earlier, they can practice before they take boards, they're not getting the support of the staff nurses because they're overwhelmed. And I've had so many of my graduates reach out desperate for someone to listen to them, to just guide them, give them support. And I, I challenge us all, I get emotional about it because I'm worried that they're just gonna say, forget it and leave. I challenge each one of you to reach out to one or two of your graduates and just like Brother said, ask them how they're doing. What can we do to help? I know we don't have a lot of resources right now, and we don't have bandwidth to, you know, help let them move in with you and support them in that way. But I think what we can do is be a listening ear and support them so that they stay in the profession because they're not getting that connection where they're at. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And if I could reinforce important. what you just said, that reaching out applies at every level because it isn't just the new graduate. Every level of graduate is experiencing great distress and they need someone to reach out. And if we can, they would really value that connection. Thank you, thank you for the sharing that. The retention is so important. Producing is only one part. Yep. It's the retention. Good morning, I'm Judy Pelletier from Upper Cape Tech. We are a practical nursing program on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. I have a concern. Um, I think the publication from National Council last summer with the quality indicators, very valuable. That article, that research, quality indicators, as well as red flags. I'm concerned, and I've seen it at our Board of Nursing, that they are using the lack of the quality indicator as identifying a pr the program is problematic. Quality indicators are something we should be striving for, but absence a red flag, or absence rather a quality indicator is not the red flag. They have distinct quality indicators and distinct red flags. And absence quality indicators does not equal a problem. And I see that document being interpreted in that way, um, which if all of the quality indicators were required of all programs, we'd see a lot of programs would be gone tomorrow because it would, you know, things like certified simulation lab and a complete, everyone is certified in simulation. That's not something that can happen quickly um, and certainly needs a lot of budget planning. So I just want to express that because I know you um, have the ability to work with NCSBN and, uh, um, you know, that's not what the intention of that document is, I'm sure and so therefore it shouldn't be used that way. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Good morning, Tanya schneider -Eif. I am from the University of Maryland and also a member of the 2015 Sim Leader Cohort. And in March of 2020, when the world shut down and everyone went to online, our Sim and skills educators were still coming to campus. They developed cleaning strategies, they allowed spaces for our learners to come and practice. And so I really want to just take a moment to say thank you so much mm. to all of those brave souls who came to campus so the students could learn. So thank you. You are absolutely you. correct. Thank you, Susan. So my name is Colette Schwartz and I'm from the Southeast Technical College in South Dakota. And based off of all of what you have said as far as mental health, we have had several students recently in the past couple weeks just share with us that they no longer, and these are, I should um, explain. So the program that I currently teach in is an LPN to RN program. So these students are currently working full time in addition to going to school. And so we have had several students just recently say um, that they are you know, overworked, that they no longer are able to put their heart and soul into furthering their nursing career because they don't have the resources available there for their mental health. And in fact, one of them said, I can no longer even go into healthcare because I'm not seeing the support that I wish I could provide for my, you know, for my patients. Um, in in ourselves and yes, we do provide counseling at our um, college, but I'm just curious if anybody else has any resources or a Support that they provide for their students Besides us because we're only you know We can only provide so much too and we do reach out to our students But it's one of those things that every, everybody everybody's burnt out right now, so just wondering what other resources we have available. Okay, thank you. And that is a major national issue. And we, we will continue yeah. on, yes. but if anyone has answers for that, please uh, proceed to the microphone. Cheryl Schmidt again. I want to follow up on Cheryl Taylor's comment about hand washing. I've taught community health, public health nursing for 47 years. And I remember in the 80s when the HIV AIDS epidemic came out, the CDC noticed that if you use hand sanitizer at home about 10 times, household bacteria become resistant to it. What about our uh, hospital-acquired infections? I use it very little, and I'm out there doing vaccines and testing and everything else because I don't want to have that resistance develop. So I think we need to definitely follow what Cheryl talked about, go back to hand washing as much as possible. Great. We have a response to the previous speaker about uh, assistance for students. Can we share that now? Sure. This is Sue in the back. Yes, go ahead, okay. Sue. Okay. Yes, thank you. I'm Linda Flynn. I'm the Dean of Rutgers School of Nursing in New Jersey. And while none of us have the definitive answer, there are things that um, we can do as schools to help our students and not just our students, but nurses across our region. For example, at Rutgers, we immediately uh, implemented Schwartz rounds across oh, the state. Yeah. We implemented nurse-to-nurse -nurse hotline across the state, and we implemented um, stress first aid for nurses across the state. We have now incorporated those resources into our undergraduate and our graduate curricula. Uh, again, it's not the definitive answer. It's a beginning, um, but we are seeing um, nurses participate in these activities. We're very worried about the mental and emotional health of our students, but also of nurses across the country. So while I have the microphone, let me just say on behalf of deans everywhere, thank you so much faculty for what you have done over the last year and a half. I've never been more proud to be a nurse or a nurse educator. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you. Judy Halstead, Professor Emeritus, Indiana University School of Nursing, and past president, National League for Nursing. 
First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity today to bring all of these concerns and strategies for improvement forward. We've heard a lot about burnout, burnout in nurse educators, burnout in our students and uh, the staff, and I wanted to just bring up the word preceptors. We create learning environments, and our learning communities consist of our faculty, our students, and our preceptors. And from conversations I've had this morning with educators at breakfast, I know that preceptors are so burnt out, uh, well, the staff are so burnt out that they can't precept. And I was just wanting to bring that issue up. If there's something that the National League for Nursing and other nurse organizations can do together, because this is going to take collaboration across education and practice to look at sustainable and viable preceptor models for the future. And uh, thank you for the opportunity yes. to speak. Thank you, thank Judy. You. And um, I, I know that part of the challenge for the preceptors is that they often are pulled between working overtime in their direct care role and trying to support students and it's not that they don't want to support students it is you know wh which is the priority and where am i needed and that even creates more angst for them so you are right they need to be recognized yes uh, hello um in response to um professor emeritus Allstead's comments and others about nursing transition um i ask again that you look locally within your state as massachusetts rhode island league for nursing did we collaborated with the Organization of Nurse Leaders, the practice side, um, and through that collaboration in a grassroots effect, uh, in a grassroots campaign in 2020, we founded, um, um, uh, we, we, we developed uh, new nurse graduate support groups, which are ongoing, um, and we're trying to get them uh, to be more utilized uh, in Zoom um, format, but they are held every Tuesday afternoon, and, and new graduates can come those that are seeking employment, we can give them some job tips, and those that are actually in the midst of it. And then second of all, we did develop preceptor development models, um, largely around Susie Fornaris' uh, uh, critical thinking um, model of thought for the NLN, and um, advocacy model. And then lastly, um, one of the things that I think, <laughs> always the optimist, Governor Baker in our state in Massachusetts um, allowed senior nursing students to, and, and those that had just graduated to actually practice as nurses um, under the auspices of another nurse. And through the collaboration with ONL, I was speaking with um, Amanda Oberlees and Ashley Waddell the other day, and it looks like we're not looking at that model. We're not studying that model. There's a perfect, out of chaos comes opportunity, uh, transition to practice model that's happening right here in our arms right now, and no one's studying it. So mm. we're gonna get together and do that. I ask that we need to substantiate our practice through education and research. Look around what's happening as a result of COVID, what's working. If it's working, get a pilot study done. Send it to NEP for a research brief, right? So there are things that we can do. You can do this. We just haven't done it yet, Great. right? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we're going to try to take those of you who are at the mic but we are almost run out of time. I love that we used up all of our time with you all. So back here at this mic, please. Um, thank you so much. My name's Hannah. I'm from the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Um, we are so very lucky in the state of Colorado. We were able to get the NEDQR grant, which is nursing education, practice, um, retention, quality also <laughs> um, grant. And um, we've been taking students over at our federally qualified health center. Um, the students have been able to learn about trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, harm reduction. Uh, they've gone out on street outreach. They've gone into the ho hotels where we're trying to isolate patients who are at risk for getting COVID. They've gone to the COVID hotel just doing care management and not entering the rooms. Oh. They have... Um, uh, taking care of patients inside of the clinics, both our small, you know, our satellite clinics and our major clinics, um, and done respite care with patients who are getting released from the hospital and going into a respite program instead of going out to the streets. We've also developed a program for fundamentals of nursing where we had 20 students come and um, learn how to give uh, COVID vaccines, and they ran our COVID vaccine clinic during the height of vaccine vaccinations 
and um, they vaccinated over 3,000 patients. Oh, wow. um, we developed this program over the last three years. Unfortunately, our funds run out in July of 2022. And we've been able to be so supportive of students. We've had students who have seen people killed on the street when they go out in street mm -hmm. medicine, and we've been able to do, um, you know, wrap around love sessions for the students so that they know that they're supported. I had a student who had that kind of experience and her takeaway was that um, when she goes to look for a job, she's going to ask them how they handle secondary trauma when they go for interviews. Um, I'm so proud of the work that we're doing. Yeah. I'm so Excuse proud you. of the evidence-based practice we've been able to bring in. They all get access to clear triage and up-to-date and Hippocrates when they come into our clinicals. Um, I'm so scared that we're going to lose this opportunity. And last year, we had 59 community health students and 19 capstones, 20 fundamentals of nursing students. And we started with two behavioral health, but I've already had another four behavioral health students this year. And I'm just hoping that we don't lose a program that talks about diversity, that talks about LGBTQ care, that talks about um, you know medication-assisted treatment that helps, like the students leave and they know what the difference is between methamphetamine and cocaine. They, they understand these things and that's what human beings in the United States are really dealing with right now. And I'm really scared of losing funding. So um, my name's Hannah Bass. If anybody has any ideas of where we might be able to receive funding, because I wanna be able to support your students and to be able to give them clinical rotations and not to have an awesome federal grant like NEDQR that stops after four years after we've developed and then have nowhere else to receive funding. Thank you Thank and you. kudos to you. That's yes. amazing. Kyle Luce again, sorry to jump back up here. I'm a third year BSN student and I wanted to jump on a leadership soapbox again. Uh, what Dr. Malone said really kind of spoke to me and I wanted to get back up here and ask how many of you your faculty are advisors for your local SNI? Please raise your hand. I was hoping for an overwhelmingly more amount because it only takes a small nudge in the right direction for faculty to push students into leadership. I was not, you know, a captain or president of my local uh, student council in high school. I did the National Honor Society went for my high GPA and I walked across that aisle and I was done. I came to nursing school and I was like, well, I wasn't very involved in high school. I just stuck to grades and kind of kicked myself out the door. I want more with my life. I want to actually be a leader for the future. And I found my local SNA, which led me to my state, which led me to the presidency of the National Student Nurses Association, one of the highest positions you can achieve as a nursing student. And I started out as nothing with leadership experience. And yet I stand here today, and I wish more students were able to stand here today and hear what you faculty are going through that we can also help. And I want you guys to not only see yourselves as professors and nurse educators, but as colleagues with your nursing students. Imagine yourself as the nurse manager of all of the nurses on your floor, because you form a relationship with your students. You don't want to put yourself on a higher pedestal that keeps you to an unattainable and untouchable position. We want to be able to kind of communicate and form this bond to where we feel capable of sharing our mental health issues, as many of you have stated, and as well as our goals in life. And many of that can be achieved through the networking and possibilities that are open through networking at events such as these that you can only really attend if you're in a higher standard leadership position. As well, please, when you're at your student associations, try and talk to other nursing students and really network with them and make them feel as though they can make a change in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Malone. Dr. Malone, go. Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Beverly Malone, President and CEO for the National League for Nursing. Apologies for extending the time over the time, but I heard the desperation in Hannah's voice about what next to do, 
And I, I, there are other places to look for money, colleagues. It's buried in corporations that inhabit your city and need nurses to care for their employees. Go knock on those corporate doors and explain the wonderful work you're doing and their obligation to keep their employees healthy. They got little money stashed in all kind of places. And you, you are the one who can liberate their money. <laughs> A last comment, please. Cecile Flores, University of Texas at Arlington. When we were talking about public health issues, one of the things we're doing at the university is collaborating with social work. And so we have a MAVS Unite is what it's called. And so students, initially it was nursing students and social work students, but now anybody in the university can sign up to be part of MAVS Unite. And it's really a students, although there's a faculty person meeting, so they meet weekly, every other week, both during the day and in the evening, so students can just get together and let each other know how they're doing. And it's, it's, it doesn't take much time or effort, but I think it really helps students feel connected and also gives them an outlet to say, ah, this is what's going on. And somebody can say, hey, I've been there and this is what I did. So I think it's a great support. And our counseling services also provides a lot of both in-person, virtual, and a lot of online resources that students can access in the day or night. So I think there are things that we're doing, but we may not know that our university is doing it. So I would just encourage you to kind of look at your website and see what resources are av already available that you do not need to reinvent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Sound you. advice. This has been amazing, and I, I cannot say how much Pat and I really thank you and appreciate all the willingness and sharing that everyone has um, done today. Um, I think it exceeded my expectations, and, yeah. and we have a lot of notes here, and we've got our homework to do. <clears throat> Most of all, I think it's important that we all work together to continue NLN's mission to promote excellence in nursing education and to build a strong and diverse nursing workforce, because it's going to take all of us to do that and we know that we are the foundation and the beginning of the future of our nursing workforce. So thank you. I personally think this is one of the best faculty meetings I've ever attended, whether at home or here. So thank you all for your input. Well, you really are the backbone of NLN. Thank you very much for your participation. So we have a coffee break. Be sure and be back here by 10 o'clock because we have that amazing, inspiring, spunt lecture Dr. Mary Fay will be presenting. And then we have our chair, Pat Yoderweiss, val valedictory presentation. We don't want to miss that. Thank you.